Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Nordman. I'm the executive editor of the Telegram and Gazette. Uh, we've done a lot of these live events before, but this is really truly a unique one that we're going to share with you tonight. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, you taking the chance um, on this night of live storytelling and sharing your evening with us. It really means a lot to us uh, to create community in this way. So I really, really appreciate it. Uh, the Telegram and Gazette Storytellers Project offers a local platform for authentic first-person uh, first storytelling that connects us as a community. It helps us relate to one another, it fosters empathy, it's personal, it's live, it's journalism told by the people who lived the stories. Journalists from our newsroom have been working with the storytellers to help them tell these true personal stories stories that you are about to hear. We feel lucky, so lucky, and thankful to be here. This is our debut, and that all of these, um, all of you here today have brought you curiosity and sense of adventure. So we're really, really happy to see all of you. We're also thank you, uh, thankful uh, for our host, the Worcester Red Sox, and this beautiful uh, DCU club. Uh, we really couldn't have done it without uh, our partners. Tonight is not a TED talk. It's not Toastmasters, it's not a how-to talk or an inspirational speech. It's not an educational lecture or slideshow. Uh, nobody's going to sell you anything, uh, not even an idea. Uh, instead, this is storytelling, and storytelling is based on visiting, and everybody knows how to visit. Uh, you open your heart, your mind, and you pay attention. So that we can all get a little bit closer, we invite you to do that here tonight. Some of the storytellers will be polished and professional. Some will be casual and conversational. Some will be funny. Others will reflect on more complicated truths. We ask you to receive them all because that's how communities are made. One note about one of our stories. One of our stories mentions the subject of bullying and suicide but re resolves in a place of hope and resilience. We're letting you know this ahead of time so you know what to expect. Tonight we're here to listen to stories based on one theme, growing up. We think you'll feel energized, inspired, and maybe a little bit nostalgic as we share them. At the Telegram and Gazette Storytellers Project, our newsroom helps people tell true stories about who they are, what they do, and why it matters. Nationally, the project has been around since 2016 and has created more than uh, 6,000 tellers during those shows. We connect to create empathy. Online and in person, the project is a nationwide series of live storytelling events that features neighbors and notables sharing true first-person stories. What makes us unlike any other storytelling event is that the USA Today journalists here in Worcester coach the storytellers to develop their stories that fundamentally serve their communities. And now I'd like to introduce our first storyteller, Dave McGrath. Dave is a comedian, a writer, a speaker, and an educator from nearby Westboro. He will tell a story about living with a chronic disease, fighting cancer, with humor and grace and lots of help from his very large Irish Catholic family. <laughs> Dave, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Dave. Thanks everyone for being here. So yes, I grew up in nearby Westboro, Massachusetts, part of a big Irish Catholic family. I'm the middle of five. I have everything you can have but a twin. Older brother, older sister, younger brother, younger sister. We grew up in a sports-loving family, watching and playing, in particular hockey. We loved our Bruins. We watched, and I watched hockey and played hockey. Now, what do hockey players pride ourselves on? We pride ourselves on being tough and having a high pain tolerance, which I did and I still do. It didn't really serve me that well, though, when I was young. When I was in third grade, I fell on my ankle at recess and walked around on it for half a day at school found out I was walking on a broken ankle. <laughs> and a few years later, I was like 11 or 12, I started having really painful symptoms, but they were embarrassing. I didn't want to tell anyone about them. 
Well, now I'm gonna tell you all about them. <laughs> it was diarrhea, blood when I went to the bathroom, cramping, it wasn't fun. But I was Mr. Hockey Player Tough Guy, I can deal with this, right? And I dealt with it for two years. I just dealt with this, you know, it hurts when I go to the bathroom and sometimes it bleed, I bleed when I go to the bathroom, I just dealt with it. And so finally, when I was a freshman in high school, I was 14 years old, the pain got so bad I couldn't stand up, right? And I was like, I had to go like this for the pain. And if I was like this, it hurt too much. And at that point, I said, maybe I should go see a doctor about this. But I went to the doctor, but I didn't tell him about all those embarrassing symptoms. I just said, it hurts right here. And he said, oh, it's probably just indigestion. Just watch what you eat and it should go away. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear, right? I didn't want to hear I had something serious going on. So I went home, it didn't get better, it got worse. And it got so bad that my mom called a neighbor of ours, Dr. Bob, who worked at UMass, said, um, Dave's not doing too well, can you come look at him? So Dr. Bob's awesome, he would come over whenever we asked him to. He examined me and he said, I think your appendix is about to burst, you need to go to the ER tonight. So my parents took me to the emergency room at UMass, they opened me up. It was supposed to be a 45 minute surgery to remove my appendix. When they opened me up, they found my intestines were basically rotting away. They removed a foot and a half of my large and small intestines, and I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Now Crohn's, if you haven't heard, is an autoimmune, chronic, gastrointestinal disease. I would never wish it on anyone. But I'm glad, I actually was glad. I was like, oh, so this is what's been going on for two or three years. I have Crohn's disease, all right. Now I know, that's a cool thing. And my family was there supporting me as usual. And we joked, we actually joked about it. I was actually in the hospital for Christmas when I was diagnosed. My older brother, John, you know, when he heard that they removed my intestines, he's like, Dave, I wonder how many farts passed through those intestines. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually happy to have a diagnosis. And I had an older sister, Carolyn, she was diagnosed with type one diabetes probably five years before that. And I'd seen her deal with chronic disease and I had seen her live as close to a normal life as she could with a chronic disease. So I was like, well, Carolyn has diabetes, I have Crohn's, I can do this too. And I did, I, I dealt with it. Found, finally found the right balance of diet, medication, and exercise, and I pretty much have my Crohn's under control. Now, so I have my Crohn's experience. Fast forward a few years, I was a freshman when the Crohn's happened. My senior year in high school, I started having different symptoms. This time, it was a headache and double vision. And I learned from my Crohn's. I was like, well, last time I had something serious going on, I waited for years and I went to the doctor, they need to remove some of my intestines. So maybe I'll go to the doctor first this time. So I was seeing double. I thought maybe something was wrong with my contact lenses, so I went to my eye doctor. He didn't know what was wrong with me, he referred me to another doctor. Finally, the third doctor I saw, and this is all like within a week of my headache starting and double vision. The third doctor, who's an ophthalmologist, neurologist at UMass, he looked at me and he's like, oh, so yeah, something's going on here, something's going on. And my mom and I were actually about, we're like literally walk, putting our coats on, walking out of his office, and my mom said, should we call you if his headaches get worse? And he looked at my chart like he didn't know I was having headaches. So it's, a, it's an important tip, when you go to your doctor, make sure they know all your symptoms. Because as soon as my mom said that, he ordered a CAT scan. I'll never forget that casket. I was lying on my back, and there was a sticker of a cat with a magnifying glass saying, don't worry, it's only a cat skin. I was like, that's hilarious. <laughs> so they took a round of pictures, and then the CT technician came in, and she's like, I'm gonna remove this head plate, lean your head back, because the doctor wants more pictures from a different angle. And I was like, oh, poop. But I didn't say that. I think I went through every swear I, I ever knew in my head. Because I knew, I knew there's no way a doctor would order more pictures if there was such, wasn't something there. So I'm sitting there, and you talk about dealing with grief. Sometimes people take years. I took about five minutes. I went every single step. I was, first, it was depression. I was like, how? I mean, no. First, it was denial. I was like, there's no way I'm having something else serious. I already have Crohn's. There's no way. Then I was angry. I was like, how dare, how dare fate give me another disease? Then I was barking, I was like, all right, so whatever it is, um, just don't make it too bad, right? Then, I, then it was depression, I was like, Jesus, I have to deal with this again, another disease, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? 
And then I remembered my mom who was waiting for me outside. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> All of that negative stuff you're you're dealing with right now, you can't you can't go to your you can't go to mom and have any of those. So you're just gonna have to go out there and tell her everything's gonna be fine. And not only do you have to say it, you have to believe it. So I did. At that moment I was like, all right, accepting whatever it is, I'm going to beat it. I'm gonna go tell mom that I'm gonna beat it. You must took care of my Crohn's, they're gonna take care of, of, of whatever it is in here. So I walk out to see my mom and she's teary eyed. They actually told her before they told me. And my mom said, Dave, they found a tumor in the middle of your brain. It's pushing on your optic nerve. That's why you're seeing double. It's like, whoa. This is three days after my 18th birthday. Found out I have a brain tumor. I was like, wow. But I, I hugged her and I said, Mom, they're gonna deal with it. I'm gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. And I actually I believed it. I was like, I don't whatever it is, I don't care. We're gonna deal with it. So I was in and out of they actually thought it was benign at first because of the location. So I was in and out of the hospital for a few weeks, you know, getting tests done, getting blood drawn, which is never fun, right? But as my dad would teach you, when there's a problem, you just gotta do that stuff. That's, you know, that you can't, you know, my, my mom was the, you know, great nurturer. My dad was like the problem solver, right? And they both support, the, the combination of that support is really what got, has gotten through me through life, right? So it was a few weeks getting tests done. They still didn't know. So I had to have a biopsy done. They were gonna cut in the back of my neck and go straight up and take a piece of it out. My parents and I actually met with the surgeon who described what he was going to do. And I don't know if you've ever had to schedule brain surgery, but when you do, you basically sign your life away. You sign your life away. And I'm, there's pages and pages. I'm like, yep, yep, yep. And I saw a line and I showed it to my parents. It said, with all brain surgery, there's a slight chance the patient will undergo a severe personality change. I showed that to my parents. I was like, you guys wish, right? <laughs> Turns out, I didn't need the surgery. Like, a few days before my surgery, they found a marker in my blood which told them I had brain cancer. Not really news you're prepared to hear when you're 18. I was the first person I knew I had, who had cancer. It was me. Not, not the news, but I was actually, it's weird hearing that, because but I was like, well, I know what it is. So that's good, knowing what you have is good. The interesting thing about my tumor was that even though it was in the middle of my brain, it was the same kind of cells as testicular cancer, proving I'm a dickhead. <laughs> uh, how, how many people get biological proof of that? I think my brothers and sisters said it so often, it actually happens. But I was glad they knew what kind of tumor it was, they knew what the treatment plan was, I was gonna get six rounds of chemotherapy followed by radiation. It's like, cool, we have a plan, that's awesome. So there I am in, at UMass, about to get my first round of chemotherapy. Who walks into my room but Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob came in to tell me that he had read studies that showed cancer patients who use visualization when they're getting treatment, have higher success rates. I was like, what's that? <laughs> so he told me, he's like, well, when you get your chemo, close your eyes and picture it traveling through your veins up into your brain and attacking the tumor. And that's exactly what I did. Paired with the best late 80s hair bands that were available to me at the time. There I was listening to Skid Row, Extreme. It was, it was 1992, so I was actually into the grunge too, listening to Pearl Jam as well. There was a band, Babylon AD, who had a song called Bad Blood. I'm like, that's perfect for this, what I'm going through. So that's what I did. I visualized every round of chemo, I visualized. And I kept, I watched, this is the summer between my senior year and freshman year of college. I think I watched a funny movie every single day that summer. I kept laughing, even at my worst. When I was feeling my worst, I was like, well, the cancer's feeling this too, right? I tried to put a positive spin on every, every situation, good or bad. So I went through chemotherapy that summer, not normal, a normal thing to do. And then my freshman year of college started and my doctors and family were like, we think you should take the first semester off to recover and you know, get your strength back, which that sounds like a good idea. 
18-year-old Dave wasn't having it. 18-year-old Dave said, I say when I start college. Cancer doesn't tell me when to start college. So my last round of chemotherapy was my first weekend of college. Got my last round of chemo. And then the radiation was going to start, right? Well, the radiologist and my oncology team came in and told me, um, we don't know why, but you don't need radiation. Your cancer is gone. I knew why, because <laughs> I pictured it being gone, right? You can see my car, my orange Prius is parked right out front of here. I pictured that parking spot. That's not a coincidence, it works. <laughs> So Crohn's and cancer, I would never wish Crohn's and cancer on anyone, right? They're, they're really hard diseases, but they've taught me so much, right? Crohn's taught me, if you have symptoms, don't wait, go to the doctor. Brain cancer has taught me so, it taught me so much, right? But you know, the most important thing, it taught me to value my health, but it taught me that the only thing in life that really matters are the people that you have in your life. And I've been so blessed to have a great family, friends, and all of you here listening to my story. Thank you so much. Have a great night. in the same era, so um, thank you very much for sharing that story. Um, so let's bring our, our next storyteller to the stage. Um, our next storyteller, uh, Arnold uh, Polda, a retired Worcester public school teacher, uh, Ray, uh, born and raised in Worcester. Uh, he will share his story about a cross-country trip that for the very first time convinced him that he was truly self-reliant. Welcome to the stage, Arnold. notice that this picture taken a week ago of the five of us, on, I'm the only one who's not smiling? <laughs> In Yiddish, we call this a fabisina punum, which means a bitter face. I don't know what's going on. Everyone else is happy. <laughs> not me. A couple of hours ago, I turned to my wife and I said, this is going to feel like my bar mitzvah. <laughs> 62 years ago. But the story begins before my bar mitzvah. Bar, I said bar mitzvah. When I was six years old, at Bay Street School, during recess, I fell and hit my head. I was crying, whining, it hurt. Fortunately, my older sister was also at May Street School, and she walked me home. My mother took me to the doctor, and he told me after a little bit of testing and analysis that I had sustained a concussion. No big deal. And later on, in later years, they found that I had sustained a wound, an injury to my left frontal lobe, right here. But no big deal. No symptoms, no consequences, nothing. So I go back to school, and then I'm, I'm at Bard College in New York in my sophomore year, and my father got me a car, and I was thrilled. And he told me to come home and get the car. So on a Friday in October of 1965, I got home, and I end the car, an ugly brown Bjork. But did I care? Absolutely not. Gorgeous. So I drove the car back to school, and previous to that, in school, in that same semester, I had started to experience, as a 19-year-old, some neurological symptoms. One day in the shower, I fell. Another day in French class, la tombe de ma tante, ou à la bibliothèque. <laughs> I 
think I fell there. That's what I deserved. I was such a bad French student. But then, so I come home and get the car, and I'm driving back on the Mass Pike, 70 miles an hour. I'm fine. And I had what they call an aura, A-U-R-A. -A. And an aura is a signal of something more serious to come a little bit later on. And it's a series of thoughts and images and sounds and everything. But fortunately, an aura goes away as quickly as it comes on. So I'm driving. The aura comes along. I'm able to keep control of the car. And I get back to Bard. And I had a date that night. And I'm sitting at the Beekman Arms, which is a lovely, beautiful tavern and it's quiet and all of a sudden I had a terrible headache so I put my head down on the table hoping the headache would go away it didn't what happened instead is I had a grand mal seizure flipping over the back of my chair onto the floor in front of my day, in front of everybody, the next morning I wake, I wake up, I'm in the hospital. My parents came to get me, left me back to Worcester, into St. Vincent's Hospital, where I'm there for weeks on end trying to figure out what's going on with this stuff. And eventually it turned out it was fairly simple. I had epilepsy due to that tear in my left frontal lo lobe. And so I missed that semester. And I'm home, and at the time, you couldn't say the word epilepsy and driving in the same sentence. It was something of an oxymoron. And so they suspended my license. But while I was home, recovering in that semester, I gradually started to, to drive again. And taking my younger siblings to their dance classes and their guitar lesson, etc., and doing errands for my mother. And so, with my parents' permission and a note from my doctor, and my father had some friends at the uh, at the motor vehicle, <laughs> and so all that helped. And they gave me back my license, but on a suspended basis, no long trips, no arduous driving or anything like that. On, a, on just, just, just this much, but that was okay. So I went back to school. I'm getting ready to go back to school. Now in the spring semester of 1966, my father buys me a new car, and I was thrilled. And at the time, when you bought a car, everything extra cost more money. So automatic transmission, no way. Stick shift, three on the tree. I, some of you might remember what that is. And Arnold, a radio, another $50. Dad, save the money, I don't need it. I had just started to play a little bit of harmonica. So I bought a rack over my neck. <laughs> on top of old Smokey. That's all I could play. Oh, and a little bit of, oh, Susanna, now don't you cry for me. So I figured, no radio, I don't need it, save the money, I'll just play my harmonica. I went back to school, spring semester of 1966, and started to make plans for the summer. A friend of mine who went to school nearby had an uncle who lived right on Sunset Strip in Los Angeles. And he said, well, why don't we go out to Los Angeles and spend the summer there and have a great time, meet some pretty girls, and do what 19-year-olds do. Great idea. So, but his school got out earlier than mine did. So he went out there at the end of May, and Bard, which was on a trimester system, I got out at the end of June. He flew out there, and I'm getting ready to take a trip out to drive my car out there, that red Plymouth Belvedere. One problem, my license is still not suspended, but limited. 
So my parents said, good plan, Arnold, but you're going to need help. So what I did was, before school was over, I posted a notice to the bulletin board at bar, the old-fashioned way, with tails on it, and with my name and dorm room number and everything, and I said, I'm driving cross country. Here's my name and number. Who wants to go with me? So sure enough, two guys show up, my, show up at my room and say, yeah, we want to go. I say, great, you'll help me drive. You know how to drive a tree on the tree? Yup, no problem. And I said, and you'll help me with gas and tolls, correct? Yeah. Not so correct. <laughs> we don't have any money, Bill and Dave say. I said, the heck with you. I didn't say the heck. I said something else. But that was the end of that relationship. And now it's the end of the semester also, and the plans are still afoot. And I go home, and I'm preparing to drive to the coast. One problem. I was going to drive alone? Not nice. So what I did is what all of everybody else would do. I lied to my parents. <laughs> Yeah, I have plenty of help. I'm picking up Dave and Bill, and the three of us will drive. Tuesday morning, my father takes me to Messier's Diner on Water Street, the best diner in the world. Wonderful. Early in the morning, fried eggs over easy, hash browns, mounds of toast, bacon which I couldn't have because my mother kept a kosher kitchen. So extra bacon. <laughs> Delicious. And more fried eggs and everything. And then gives me a big hug and also gives me $50. And back then in 1966, that was a lot of money. And I was happy. So I point that car to around 290, going west, and after that, it would be Route 90 all the way to Chicago, etc. And I was so excited and so overwhelmed with this journey all by myself. I had never been further west than the Hudson River at Bar. So I get in the car and I'm driving five miles, ten miles, going, and I'm flooring it with my three speed. I'm also overcome, however, with fatigue out of nowhere. I tried to keep my eyes open, didn't help. After 15 miles of a 3,000 mile journey, I had to stop <laughs> and rest. It was humiliating, it was embarrassing, but I was alone, so did I care? No. I woke up after a half hour and drove straight from Sturbridge all the way to Chicago. All right, not so straight. I had to stop and fill up the, the tank with gas and go use the bathroom and down a hamburger and whatever, but almost. And I got to Chicago, right by Chicago, and from Chicago to LA. Back then, Route 66, get your kicks. On Route so it's down through Missouri, Joplin, Missouri, Oklahoma City. Looks so, oh, so pretty, you'll see. Amarillo, Gallup, New, anyway. So, I'm on Route 66 alone, and then I'm in Oklahoma, and then I'm in New Mexico, and it's hot. And I'm in the Mojave Desert, and it's hot, and I'm tired and I'm hungry, and I didn't know whether to roll the window up or put it down because the air coming in was 99 degrees. But I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm sweating, didn't know what to do, and I might have been a little bit delirious also because what did I see by the side of the road? Two guys hitching two guys hitching a ride. They could have been St. Paul and St. Peter, or Rabbi Paul and Rabbi Peter. I don't know, but I stopped and picked them up. And guess who they were?
guess who they were? It was Bob and Dave from Bard College. I couldn't believe it. But was I happy to see them? Give me a break, was I happy to see them. Bob, oh, get in here. Can you drive that three in a tree? Yeah, I can. All right, then do it. Because I am jumping to that back seat. I'm tired and hungry and delirious, or I need to sleep it off. And so we did. You'll see Amarillo, Flagstaff, Arizona, don't forget Winona, Ludlow, Barstow, San Bernardino, we drive. Route 66, and we get to LA, and I drop them off somewhere. I didn't care where. And I go and find my friend at his uncle's house on Sunset Boulevard, and I picked him up, and we went and rented an apartment, and we were right near an A and W hamburger stand, and root beer. And every day we had A and W burgers, and the root beer came in big gallon jugs. We held it over our shoulder, and we poured that root beer. It was delicious, and we met lots of pretty girls. We had a great time, and I just spent two or three weeks with my daughter and her husband and her little daughter, five and a half year old Dora. And Dora's favorite word is actually. Because she likes precision and she likes the verification of stuff. And her favorite sentence fragment is not even close. Why, I have no idea. Not even close, Grandpa. Over and over again. Actually, not even close, she said to me. 1966, that trip, I overcame adversity and challenges and other, both physical and mental. It was the best summer of my life, actually. <laughs> and actually, next to it, nothing else compares. Not even, not even close. <laughs> So, uh, we, haven't even, we haven't even brought up the comedian yet. <laughs> uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, give a little shout out and a thank you to uh, some of our storyteller coaches. Uh, if you could just kind of wave, stand up, little little tip of the cap. Kim Ring, uh, reporter from the Telegram, right here. Uh, I think Mike Elflin uh, in the back there. Anusha Ramia over here. And uh, Victor Infante, where, where are you? Vic, Victor's in the back. Thank you, Victor. You know, we, appreciate, uh, we appreciate all your time and all of the, uh, the storytellers who took the time out of their schedules and not only rehearsed and practiced with the, uh, with the coaches, uh, but took the time out of their, uh, their schedules to be here tonight. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so now it's on to the uh, now it's on to the real comedian. No, no offense, Arnold. Uh, Lou Ramos uh, will tell his story about uh, transitioning of all things from hardcore rap to comedian, which was inspired by a chance meeting with a celebrity. Lou, welcome to the stage. Thank you, thank you. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, I was about nine to 10 years old when I fell in love with stand-up comedy. At the time, we were living in the projects. It was my mother and the three of us. And side note, real quick, having spent a quick stint as a single parent myself, I can say without a doubt that my mom's an absolute titan for raising three people up as long as she did. You know, did she make mistakes? Absolutely. She had all three of her children by the time she was 22 with two deadbeats at that. But did she quit? No, she handled her business like a boss and brought out three people that didn't end up being total wrecks. We're more like fender benders. <laughs> but we're all, we're all alive, well, and semi-responsible adults, so I think it's a big win, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> so what we would do, my mom, as strong as she was, expect as strong as my mother was, to assume that she didn't need any kind of help, 
raising kids on her own would be ridiculous, right? So she did what a lot of parents back then would do. They put TVs in their kids' bedrooms. <laughs> and just like a lot of those parents, she didn't stop to think about the consequences of connecting cable up to those TVs. <laughs> so I blame HBO for nurturing a nine-year-old's desire to talk filthy. <laughs> and what we would do, right? We'd wait for her to go to sleep. We'd turn the volume down real low. And then we'd watch legends go to work. George Carlin, oh. Rodney Dangerfield, Eddie Murphy. If I'm being 100% honest, Eddie Murphy is the biggest influence in my life. I wanted to be him. I wanted to move like him. I wanted to talk to him, like him, talk like him more than anything. He was more of a father to me than my own father was, to be 100% honest. So, really what, what was going on back then is my brother and I were just sitting there watching TV all night, just like trying to get this comedy on. But I was a nine-year-old kid, I didn't have a stage, you know? So I decided to be a class clown. I'd go to school every day and make people laugh. It got me in trouble. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. But I was a nine-year-old kid running around with a lot of anger in my heart. You know, I didn't have a father at home. Making people laugh is therapeutic, you know? It actually helped me combat the pain of, of coming up alone like that. But still, I was a nine-year-old kid, so it probably wasn't a good idea to keep telling dick jokes, right? <laughs> Not at all. It got to the point, at one point, my mom had to sit me down, and it sounded something like this. Oye, pendejito. Do you want to talk, talk trash in my house? Fine. Do you go outside, you watch your mouth, or I'm going to kick your ass. Now, I'm paraphrasing. It was way worse than that. <laughs> But this woman chased me around the house one time with a wiffle ball bat, so I wasn't even, wasn't even trying to test her, you know? Around the same time that she put those TVs in the, into the bedrooms, I also was introduced to another passion of mine, rap music. So the way that went down, <laughs> a family friend came over, and he asked my mom, his name was Jacob, he asked my mom why it is that she doesn't play real music for us. At the time, we'd be listening to... Whitney Houston, Janet Jackson, a little Spanish music, you know? And he wasn't having it. So he takes a tape out of his, his Walkman and he puts it into the, to the, the radio that's on the table. I'll never forget this. It was my mom, me, Jaco, kitchen table, radio right in front of me, right? He pops the tape and he hits play. This is the first time that I listened to Ice Cube, America's Most Wanted. <laughs> I heard that. You know what's up. <laughs> Probably not what you should be playing for a nine-year-old kid, right? Didn't matter. What happened, what happened was complete hilarity because my mom kept trying to get at the radio and Jacob would just slap her hands away playfully like, no, 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 let it happen. Let it happen. She finally got the radio, pulled it away, but it was it. It was too late. Damage had been done. I'd been exposed to the glorious sounds of gangster rap. And from that point on, hip-hop just basically took over my entire life. And for three decades, even now, even now I still write and record rap music, but I'm up here telling you about how I shifted the comedy. So clearly my rap career has been a huge hit. <laughs> so how did I shift? How did I move over? So it was October, 2013. My best friend and I, Ryan, we decided we were gonna go to New York City to for, uh, party for the weekend. We made reservations at the world famous comedy cellar because we're both fans of stand up. So we're partying all day Sunday. It's Columbus Day weekend, just to, so you understand what's going on. It was a Sunday. We had watched the Pats win um, at a San Francisco 49ers bar because they were playing the New Orleans Saints, and the only other bar we could find was a New Orleans bar. I figured that would be a bad idea. So we spent the whole day hanging out, drinking. We get over to the comedy cellar and we notice that there's a bar right up above where the, where the cellar is, right? So we go into this bar, nice place. It's got black blackboard top tables and a like, bowl of chalk at each table so that you can take the chalk out, draw whatever you want. There's a monitor above the bar showing whoever's downstairs on stage at that time. Really cool. So I'm sitting there, you know, drunk. <laughs> Drawing Frankenstein on the table because it's Halloween season and I'm feeling completely unoriginal. So I'm putting stitches on Frankie's head, right? When all of a sudden I hear my buddy go, hey. Immediately I look up like, what? I'm shook, I thought something was about to pop off, you know what I mean? 
nope, he goes, I think that's Tracy Morgan over there. <laughs> Man, shut up. That's just some guy hanging out with his friends. He goes, no, that's Tracy Morgan. Now, my buddy Ryan is the whitest person I know. When I say that, I don't mean personality-wise. I mean my guy's skin is lighter than an albino's backside. <laughs> but in this moment, he was damn near translucent. So I was like, oh man, what's got him all shook up? So I decided to take a real good look. I turn, I look, and I see a very familiar face wink back at me. I turn and look at my brain, like, hey, Tracy Morgan's over there. <laughs> I know, I know. We should go over and ask for an autograph or a picture. Now, my best friend's also my music producer. So I tell him, I'm like, hey, what if we made it to where we want to go? And we were just hanging out at a bar on a Sunday night with our friends, and people start coming up asking for autographs and for pictures. How would that make you feel? I'd hate it. Yeah, me too. So how about we just let them do their thing? So we decided not to be those guys, right? But what we did do was eavesdrop on their conversation with a couple of creeps. And what they were talking about was really interesting because there was an event that we had no context on. But they were comparing it to the 1995 Source Awards. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Source Awards are hip hop awards. Back in 1995, Death Row CEO, Death Row Record CEO, Suge Knight, took to the stage and basically said every artist that doesn't want their producer dancing in their video to come to Death Row Records. Now, the problem with that is that it was a shot fired clearly at Sean Combs, who was the CEO of Bad Boy Records. Um, he had a very, very clear habit of dancing in his artist's video. So this is what happened. The whole thing culminated with the death of Tupac Shakur and Chris the Notorious B.I.G. Wallace. What event he, they were comparing to that, I have no idea. <laughs> but we did hear, we did hear a, comic, um, she, she, a comic say, you're right, Tracy. It was just like Death Row Records. And that's when you hear Tra Tracy respond with, you remember that speech? You remember that speech? You don't like this, come to Death Row Records. You don't like that, come to Death Row Records. And we're giggling. He clearly sees that we're laughing. Because at that moment, I feel a hand on my shoulder pull me. And in my face, one of my favorite comedians says, you don't like flowers? Come to Death Row Records. <laughs> then he disappears. There's a door behind me, I didn't even know it was there. He disappears through that door. And this is all one swift motion. You hear from downstairs his name get called and the crowd, the crowd applauds, right? Suddenly he's up on the, on the monitor above the, above the bar. I'm just wowed at the whole scenario. I was like, wow, this really just happened. So he does a set, he comes back up, goes back to hanging out with his friends. And I'm just looking over there. And all he's doing is making his friends laugh. And this was the moment. He's over there making his friends laugh. He was downstairs making strangers laugh. Comes up, he's making his friends laugh. And I look at my buddy, I'm like, yo, you see what he's doing? He's like, no, I'm not trying to be a creep. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see what's going on? He says, he's like, no, what is it? Like he's over there just making friends laugh. Like, that's what I do, that's what I do with you guys all the time. He's like, yeah, that's why I've been telling you, you gotta get into this. Again, my best friend is my music producer. <laughs> so my producer is telling me to quit rapping and go into comedy. Which clearly means I'm easily one of the greatest rappers of all time. So it took me four years before I actually followed through and, and started doing comedy. I'll tell you why. My wife signed me up for a class without telling me, and I let her know the truth. I'm like, if this is something you want to do, you should do it. And I told her I was scared. The idea of being on stage with my band, that was different. I was up there with my team. We backed each other up. It was great, right? Comedy, I'd be up there alone. Microphone in my hand, just me and the mic. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. It scared me. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. Well, this class is non-refundable. <laughs> so if you don't take it, I'm kicking your ass. <laughs> the women in my life are just always <laughs> threatening me with physical harm. <laughs> so I went and I did the class. It was fantastic, a great experience. And my journey thus far, I'm not famous by any means, but my journey thus far has been fantastic. I've made a lot of really good friends. 
uh, bonds that I hope last forever. And the reason that I did that was overcoming that fear. But the biggest thing that I learned from this entire experience is the universe speaks to you. And you have to take the moment to be cognizant of what's going on around you. You're gonna miss the universe telling you that there's something that you need to do. Because sometimes, it's not just a guy hanging out in a bar with his friends. Sometimes, it's Tracy Morgan. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker, Ashley Wonder, is a um, teacher in the Worcester Public Schools. She teaches uh, nonverbal autistic uh, children in the Worcester Public Schools, and she is going to tell a her story about how uh, she overcame uh, bullying as a teenager to find her voice in poetry. Welcome to the stage, Ashley. wonder since the day of my birth. Miracle babies, what they called me. I counted it as value. I seen it as worth. One pound, three and a half ounces, with less than a 10% chance of survival. October 8th, 1983. I spent 119 days in that incubator left with my nose a little disfigured because of a tube, but whatever the doctors gave me, I made it through. I made it through my first surgical procedure at five. Had three more with the scars to prove that I'm a walking miracle. So when was that moment I realized I was different? I wasn't always bullied. I used to be popular. When I went to Worcester Central Catholic, those were the, my favorite social emotional learning experiences. I was invited to sleepovers, had birthday party invitations, used to be on the phone with friends on a Tuesday. <laughs> and then we went to public school and all of that changed. I was always the new kid. I remember it was fifth grade Midland, Midland Street School and a bunch of girls came up to me and said, oh, this boy likes you. Now mind you, it's not, it's not the boy that I have a crush on, okay? <laughs> and they said, this boy likes you, so I said, okay, so me and my little confrontational self at that age said, hey, I hear you like me. <laughs> and he scoffed, laughed, and said, who said that? I point over to the girls, and they're all laughing. So never mind being the new girl in school, not really finding your fit yet, rejection. So a lot of that kept happening over and over. And my younger brother was always around to beat up the boy bullies, right? Because <laughs> that's what your brothers do. But who's there for you when it's the girl bullies and I'm the only daughter in my family, right? So who's there to protect you when that happens? So how did I deal with all of that? I spent too many days crying, spent too many days cutting, too many times wondering what it would be like if I swallowed that bottle of pills. So I did. But that was later. My freshman year in high school, I went to Darwin. And all the bullying finally stopped because I had a cousin who kind of took that role of being my protector because my younger brother wasn't in high school with me yet. And I remember it was in science class and this boy poured some powder on my shoulder. And at this point, you know, I'm 14 and you get really numb to the feelings and to the jokes and, and all of that stuff, right? It's not, it's not funny, <laughs> you know, it was, it was never funny to begin with. 
And I remember this girl said, I'm going to tell your cousin. I said, okay. So now it's lunchtime. We're in the cafeteria. My cousin comes over to me and says, point him out. Now, for those who didn't know who my cousin was, Bernard Johnson, he was a six feet tall, dark skinned black brother, basketball star. Okay? <laughs> and he says, point him out. I said, okay. So now I'm feeling excited because I know some justification is about to go down. <laughs> and I point out the boy, and my cousin said, you, you know, this is my cousin, right? And now this little white boy is very scared and he's shaking. <laughs> and he said, my cousin told him, apologize. And he said, I'm sorry. He said, I didn't hear you. Say it again. Now he's yelling louder, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My cousin goes, I didn't hear you. Say it again. And now this little white boy screams in the cafeteria, I'm sorry. My cousin said, you good? I said, yeah. I tell that story because my cousin is no longer living, so the fact that that's my personal memory with him really means a lot. So, at this point, um, I start writing in my journals, because that's kind of how I escaped of all these dark, empty feelings of not finding your place, all the seclusion and all, and all those things. Now, at the same time, I'm going up in church and all the black churches around here, but you only see these people on Sunday. That, and you, you don't see them during the week. It's just Sunday and that's it. Um, so that was kind of hard to adjust to and kind of find your clique as a young girl in the city. So at this time, I'm also learning music, piano and saxophone, and I took all of the all the empty feelings that I was feeling, um, even though the, the bullying stopped, I had to deal with the emotional uh, impact and how that looked at myself. Because when I looked in the mirror, I didn't like who I seen. I don't think my family knew that all this stuff was going on because you, you just didn't talk about it. Um, I was always attached to my mom's head or always smiling, so we don't talk about dark feelings, so I just vote them out. So I remember this one time my junior year in high school, my mom and I were walking in the Greendale Mall, and this girl that I've known since Midland Street was having a birthday party, and for some reason I didn't get invited. Now, mind you, I thought this girl was my friend because we're playing in band together, we're both premature babies, we have all this history, so you kind of think, oh, this is kind of a person that you're kind of cool with. So me and my mom are in the mall, and we see this girl and her mother, and my mom looks at me and said, what you gonna do? I said, we're gonna go home. And she said, no, we're gonna go talk to them. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so we confront this person and their mother, and I just wanna know, how come, where, where was my invitation? I'm not a stranger to you. We were junior in high school, what's up? <laughs> and the girl said, you know, oh, I just, I just forgot about you. So again, there's that moment of rejection, uh, not being included, even though you think this person is your friend. So, I kind of dwell more into my music now, and that kind of really shaped my life um, in writing in my notebook. And my poetry started forming very bad poetry. I, it was not, it was not anything. It was more just scribbles and very dark stuff. So fast forward to college, where. I, I took a poetry course for my first black professor, and I took whatever he taught, I took. <laughs> and this poetry class, I did not know at the time, in my early 20s, it would be the foundation of what I use poetry now, today, a, a decade plus later. So what was that moment like? I finally find my confidence, my boldness in college, and I remember watching Deaf Poetry Jam on HBO, and those were the seeds that were being planted with the poetry class where, I think I could do this. Going back to what one of the other speakers said about visualizing, every time I would watch poetry on HBO or I would see it in a, a church program with um, LA poets in the church, I would always close my eyes and visualize the stage and the lights. At this time, I'm about 23, and I also had a, a very deep awakening spiritual moment where 
all the church that I was being raised in, it, it all finally clicked and made sense. So now my poetry is not this dark, depressing, sad stuff. It's God is good, God is great, and I want to tell everybody about how much I love Jesus. Those, those are my poems, because faith is good, and faith has gotten me through everything in my life. So John Street Baptist Church, they were the first church to give me that opportunity. So what did that feel like? I don't remember the poem. I have the poem in a notebook somewhere, but I don't remember it. I remember the nerves, butterflies, I call it the bubble guts. <laughs> um, it's very nervous uh, feeling. I remember going up to the stadium, the podium, and my hands were shaking as I'm holding the mic. I have the poem in my notebook, and I read, I read it so fast, I don't know what I was saying. And I, I remember blacking out in the sense of zoning out and just being in that moment. And I remember everyone in the church was standing up, they were cheering and praising God and telling me afterwards, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. So every black church in our city of Worcester that I have performed in, and that has been the foundation of what I do now as a spoken word artist. Uh, I'm very grateful for all those opportunities because I've been doing this now a decade in, and when I go back to the churches now, they all say the same thing. You look at us now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't tell you all the, all the memories of all the different workshops I've done for all the, all the different kids all in our city and all around Massachusetts. And the one thing that I've learned when it comes to working with kids, whether with special needs or not, is they all want to be heard, they all want to be understood, and they all want to know that someone understands them. So if you didn't get anything from what I just said, that's kind of what my whole life has been about with my autistic kids and when I do workshops. When I go do workshops, I always ask the kids, what kind of poems do y'all want to hear? And they always say, Dr. Pressing Poems, Miss, Dr. Pressing Poems. I'm like, okay, I get it. It's right up my alley, I understand. But what I realized recently is, why do they always want those poems? Why is that? And that's because they don't have someone to articulate what they feel, those dark, sad, empty feelings of being secluded or alone, whether in your family or your friendships or whatever. And I realized recently that i become the woman that I needed when I was a child that I didn't see. So as it was said earlier, I'm a, I'm a parent educator in our school system, and I've been working with autistic kids for the last eight years. And one thing about kids with autism, whether they can talk or not, it doesn't matter. They know that they're different. You don't have to tell them or stare at them. They already know this. <laughs> they know that they're awkward. They know that they learn differently. And they all have the biggest smile on their faces, where a lot of times they go through a lot of situations of their lives where you, you wouldn't think that they would be so jubilant. It's the, greatest, it's the greatest gift to work with all the kids I have over 16 years, but to, to work with nonverbal students, I didn't think that I would be able to do something like that because who wants to get hit every day? <laughs> I get hit every day and it sounds a lot, but it's not as bad as it sounds because it's not, it's not a personal attack. It's just how they communicate because they can't speak. And someone has to work with these kids you know, someone has to work with them and give them the independence, no matter how small or how big that is. Someone has to be that person for them because they want to be included too, right? They want to feel seen and heard and laughed and joked with just like any other kid. And I guess I'm that person. So, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and thank you for everything you do for the children of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now it's time for me to introduce our, our final storyteller of the evening. She's no stranger to the stage or a microphone. Uh, Shweta Bhatt has been telling stories on stage for about a year and she will talk about her relationship with her grandfather and a love that will never fade. Welcome to the stage, Shweta.
I'm in the school and I'm sitting across from the school nurse. My friends, they're sitting around me and I'm bleeding. The nurse is telling me that she's going to have to cut my ring off. Now, my friends, they ask if they should call my mom. I'm 14 years old. I can take care of myself. I don't need my mom. But the nurse can't cut this ring off. I mean, she doesn't get it. Two years ago, it's October of 2003, and it's Diwali. And I mean, I love Diwali. See, I'm Indian, and I'm growing up in Burlington, Massachusetts, and Diwali is the only thing that makes growing up in Burlington, Massachusetts as an Indian worth it. I mean, I love Christmas, and I love Thanksgiving, and I give out Valentine's Day cards, and I wear shamrocks on St. Patty's Day, but Diwali is just different. I mean, the colors and the smells, and the foods, everything just lands differently. I love it. It feels really good. My mom, she hands me the phone. It's my grandfather. He's in India. Now, my grandfather just retired, and so he spends a good couple months in India to escape the freezing cold that is the Northeast of the United States of America. My grandmother, she's not retired yet, so he's there alone. And when I pick up the phone, I can see his smile. I can, I can see those dimples, and I hear him laugh. You know, that laugh. The smoker's laugh. He asks me if I want anything. Now, usually, I don't. I mean, what do you ask for from a man who has literally given up his life to give you yours? But today, I do have something to ask for. There's this girl in my class, and she has this ring. And it's a gold ring. It's kind of thick. It has a heart on it. And I really like it. And I mean, I'm 12. And I think I'm mature enough to wear rings now. I mean, I'm not going to lose it. And I'm not going to like disfigure it anyway. So I think it's time. And I ask, well, Grandpa, I would really love a gold ring, a thick band with a heart on it, and Om written in the heart. He tells me, of course. Sure, I'll get it for you. But then follows up with asking me, do you want one with diamonds? And I just laugh because that just feels like too much. <laughs> he tells me to give my phone to my sister who has never had an issue asking for what she wants. <laughs> and the day ends. I go to school the next day. It is Diwali. And I get off from the bus. I'm excited. I'm ready to come home. I can smell the snacks that are on the table. People are about to come over. And I turn the cul-de-sac. And I see a car in my driveway. Now, my parents are the kind of parents that believe a garage should be used as car storage. So we usually don't have cars on our driveway. But I mean, it's Diwali. So people are coming over. It, it makes sense. But something doesn't feel right. And my heart, it sinks into my stomach. And my walk, it turns into a sprint. And I run home. My backpack, it's jumping up and down on my back. I open the front door, and I see my babysitter sitting there. And usually, she's really excited to see me, but she's crying. And I ask her, what's wrong? What, what happened? She doesn't say anything. And I run upstairs to the master bedroom, where my mom is walking out of the bathroom. And she's crying. And I ask again, what's wrong? What happened? Your grandfather, he had a heart attack. He's in the hospital, and he's unconscious. Now I'm 12. I know nothing about heart attacks. 
All I know is that they happen to old people. And all I know I can do is Google what a heart attack is and, and what could happen. And I, I do, and I memorize all the chambers of the heart and what an aorta looks like and pretty much everything. But I don't know what to do then. So I give her a hug and I tell her that it might be okay. And she tells me that she has to go to India. She's gonna go that night with my grandmother and my uncle. And I tell her, I hope you reach in time. And so they leave. And before they get there, we get a call. My grandfather, he's passed away. Now my dad is making arrangements for a memorial service at our house. And all of these adults are going, coming over. I mean, these grown-ups that I have grown up with. And they're crying. And they're telling me how much they're going to miss my grandfather and how amazing of a man he was and, and how proud I should make him, how I should keep his spirit alive. How the heck am I supposed to keep his spirit alive? I mean, yeah, I'm going to miss him. But he lived in Pennsylvania. I didn't see him all the time. And I mean, how am I supposed to keep him alive? And why are they crying? I mean, I, I just don't get it. I, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel. Two weeks later, my dad picks my mom up at the airport. And I open the garage. And in she comes, and she smells like India. And she has this bag with all of these things that she's bought. But <laughs> she's tired, and I can see her eyes are sunken in. So I help. We take out some spices and some saris and all of these things, and she's telling, about, telling me about our family in India. And she hands me a box. And I open the box. And in it is a gold ring, a thick band, with a heart and the word Om written in it. She tells me that he must have put in the order right away because shops closed that night. And next to it is the same ring, but with diamonds. Aww. I put the ring on my finger. And that's when I realized my grandfather is that person who has always given me the things that I never asked for. I mean, both of us, we are born on September 17th. And if you look at any photo in the photo albums that are under grandpa, granddaughter, birthday parties, you will see me in the front, blowing out the candles on both of our cakes, my age in the balloons, my name on the streamers, and him standing in the back with the dimples on his face, smiling, knowing one day he was going to give his birthday to me. He was the man who would dress up every week, a newsboy cap, a short sleeve, button-down shirt, and go to the flea market. I mean, the man didn't drive, but he would get someone to drive him there, and he would go from table to table, talking to every vendor as if they were best friends. And he would buy things for other people. I mean, the things that people never asked for. Food processors, coffee grinders, blenders. And he would get them and then give them to people. And he would sit there and just smile and wait in anticipation of people opening up the gifts that he got them that they never asked for, but maybe they wanted, and maybe they needed. He was the man who would sit in his chair every Christmas and sing along as we would open the gifts that he would get us, like the fake nails that my parents never got us or the chewing gum that he very specifically hid for us in the drawers upstairs. That's what I missed. Who was going to be that? Where was that warmth 
going to be at the holidays? Where were those dimples going to be? Who is going to be that person that gave me the thing that I never asked for, but I have this ring, and so I can look down at it and remember. And now this nurse wants to cut it off my finger, and I'm not going to let her. So I tell her I will take it off. And she tells me, Shweta, it is in your finger. See, I was just messing around on a ledge outside. I always do that, and I slipped. And so the ring, it went into my finger, and it's kind of marled. And in the eye, it doesn't look really like a ring anymore, but I am going to pull it off. And my friends, they get what I'm about to do. They get what I have to do. So they're cheering me on. And I take a deep breath, and I start to pull it off my finger. And I mean, the sight of blood makes me a little woozy. So now I'm, I'm getting a little lightheaded, and I have TV snow in my eyes, and I'm about to faint. But I keep breathing, and I pull it off. And I just hate, I look at it in my hand, and it doesn't look like a ring anymore. I mean, it's, it's all messed up, and it's bloody. And I clean it, and I give it to my mom. I mean, I can't wear it anymore. I have the one with diamonds, but it just doesn't feel the same. My mom, she leaves the next day to go to India for the two-year memorial of my grandfather. And she wants to do what he always did, which was feed the village that he's from. She comes back, garage door opens, I smell it, India. We open the box, the luggage, and there's saris, there's spices, there are little knickknacks, and then there's a box. She hands it to me, and I open it, and it's my ring. And it looks like a ring again. I mean, it's a circle. And I slide it back on my finger, and it perfectly covers the scar from a couple weeks ago. And yeah, my fingers, they've gotten slightly bigger, and it's moved from my ring finger on my left hand to my ring finger on my right hand to my middle finger to my pointer finger to my pinky and back to my ring finger. But I've always worn it. And now I get to be that person with my sister at the holidays where we listen for the things people never ask for but they might want and we go and we buy them. And then we wrap them up really pretty and we put them under the tree or we hand them out at Diwali and we wait in anticipation, kind of sweating to see what the reaction of those people are going to be, the people that we love and care for so much them receiving something that they didn't know they could ask for. Because man, I miss him. But he's not gone. I get to keep the best parts of him alive. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. If I could just if I could have all our storytellers come up to the stage one more time just so everybody can give you a big round of applause. Thank you for being here tonight.